Hi, right, Freddie. I'm Zilla Blitz, and welcome. Today, we're going to do a deep dive look at two games. That's right, two, not just one. 8th Air Force and 20th Air Force, both designed by Bob Fanoff and from Fortress Games. Now, in 8th eight, Air Force, it is a solitaire game where you lead the bombing campaign over Germany over a number of months in World War II. 20th Air Force is its brother game, if you would, where you're leading the bombing campaign over a number of months over Japan in World War II. So we're going to take a look at both games, and at the end, I'm going to compare and contrast some of the differences between the two games in case you're looking to pick up one but not both of the games. Also, on the community page of the channel, there's a vote. Please go vote for which one of these two games, 8th Air Force or 20th Air Force, you want to see a full playthrough of on the channel. Let's get started. So a kind of a, a big picture overview of these two games, they're both similar in quite a few ways, right? They're both solitaire games. They're going to take roughly the same amount of time to play. 8th Air Force, you're, run, you're leading uh, groups and squadrons over Germany, trying to bomb Germany in the back half of World War II. 20th Air Force, you're leading squadrons and groups, uh, groups and squadrons over Japan in the back half of World War II uh, as the U.S. Air Force. So uh, both have very similar themes and they use similar mechanics and similar systems here. However, there are a number of differences between 8th Air Force and 20th Air Force that we'll compare and contrast at the end. Secondly, uh, I do also want to mention these are the second editions. So the second editions have uh, new player aids, updated graphics, revised and enhanced and improved rules. They come in boxes now, which is really, really nice. So uh, just kind of a reimagining of the first and a general overall improvement from the first edition games. Lastly, if you do recall, if you've been following the channel for a while, you know that I absolutely adored Save South Vietnam, which is Bob Phantom's, one of Bob Phantom's other games. So I have very high expectations for both 8th Air Force and 20th Air Force, and I'm looking forward to doing a full playthrough on the channel of whichever one of these games wins the community poll, so please go vote. With that in mind, let's take a look at 8th Air Force first, and then we'll come back, take a look at 20th Air Force, and then we'll compare and contrast. Let's talk about some general characteristics of 8th Air Force. I'm going to estimate that the gameplay length is about three to four hours. Maybe if you get faster, it'll go a little bit quicker than that. Uh, because the, there is the main campaign, which is 28 turns. And each turn in the game signifies one month. There is also a, a 16 turn short scenario in here as well. And the units that you're basically working with for both the US, uh, U.S. bomber groups and the fighter groups and also the German fighter groups are what are called groups and then attached squadrons. So you're going to have groups of planes and putting little squadrons on them to increase their strength and things like that. The game starts in January of 1943 and continues all the way through till April of 1945, although there are some win and loss conditions that can trigger the game ending before it gets to April 1945. With that in mind, let's open it up and take a look at what's inside. We have an 18-page manual, and uh, it's in color with some good handy uh, examples here. There's also in the back, we've got a page or so of designer notes that are really helpful in terms of kind of talking about some of the strategy and some of the ideas that you want to keep in mind as you're playing the game. Then an example of play in the back here with some of the graphics kind of enhancing that. Rules are updated and enhanced from the first edition. And I think basically just clarifying a lot of the questions that people had or some of the ambiguous points in the first edition. So these rules, as I've been reading through them, they look very, very clear. There is a little bit of similarity too. If you've played South Viet Saving Sa Save South Vietnam or Save Afghanistan, um, if you played either of those games, you're going to get some similarities in thinking and similarities in structure here, although these are very different games from those two games. But yeah, uh, minimal, no, I would say minimal rule set, but a very modest rule set, talking about all the rules, seems to explain things every, very, very well. As I've been reading through each section, everything seems really clear, and uh, Fortress Games also has some playthrough examples of the game up on their website if you want to kind of take a look at the game in action as you're learning it. I'm going to give this game a complexity rate rating out of a 3 out of 10, and obviously the solitaire rating goes without saying it's a 10 out of 10 because that's the really the only way you could play. I mean, you could play it collaboratively, I'm sure, working with two or three people on it, but you know, it's designed for that solo experience as the, the U.S. player taking on uh, Germany in, try, in this bombing campaign. I should mention, too, that there are some optional rules in here. There is, again, the, you know, you've got the one main campaign, then you've got the 16-turn short campaign, and there are a couple of optional rules for bringing in uh, jets to a greater degree than was historically uh, happened in World War II, both for the U.S. side, which is kind of cool to think about, and for the German side. So you have kind of a jet enhanced variant here that would be an optional rule to increase the number of kind of some options for replays and things like that. Let's jump in and take a look at our counters. These are all five eighths of an inch. Uh, these are all laser cut counters and they're really nice. They pop out and they've got kind of a little 
burnt, kind of a darkened edge to them, which makes them look really cool. They do have sharp corners, uh, kind of, you know, 90 degree angles. I was thinking to trim, trim them, but I think I'm actually not going to clip these because they just look so cool the way they are. And they've just got a really nice heft and feel to them. So I really like these counters here. And what we're looking at here now are the U.S. Uh, bomber groups, B-17s and B-24s here. And then the U.S. fighters are down in here, P P-47s, P-51s. And I think these P-59s, are those the jet variants? I'm sure, not really sure. Uh, and then we've got different, these are some of the different ranges on the fighters, but the strength numbers on the fighters here are relatively straightforward. And these, again, are fighter groups and bomber groups. And then here on this sheet here, these are all of the squadrons that you can attach to them to kind of increase their strength. So if a base squad, a base group has a strength of three, and then you add a squadron onto it, it brings it up to a four and so on. Now, none of these counters are printed on the back side, so the entire game works by just using the front side of these counters here. We look down here, we can see some of the markers now here for the, the German cities and down here for the oil refineries. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get going in here. Uh, but uh, in terms of what these counters, how they work as we look at the map and things like that. And then this is the half counter sheet here for the German fighters. So BF-109s, mostly BF-109s here, Focke-Wulf 190s. Yep, so those are our German fighters. And then we've got the jet variants down here, the Messerschmitt uh, 262s, which are down here, really cool. So that is kind of, uh, I think they show up, they can, sh the German jets can show up to a greater degree. And then there's an optional rule that can add the US jets to that to kind of uh, counterbalance them, depending on what kind of a variant you're using. These are our bombing damage tokens here, counters here, bombing campaign markers. We'll talk about that because in the game, you're uh, running campaigns, depending upon where the war is, your objectives as the US bomber groups are gonna be a little bit different. You might be trying to knock out the V1 rockets or trying to destroy German industry or helping support kind of uh, Operation Overlord and things like that. And then these again are the squadrons that get attached to the groups. And then down here, we have a few more uh, German fighters. Let's talk about our player aids. There are two of them, single-sided, that you're going to be keeping handy. These are most of the combat results for air combat and then for uh, fighters, damage and destroyds, and Luftwaffe group, scram group scrambles, and then RAF attacks. So these are all the kind of the combat tables that you're going to be rolling dice on in that to kind of generate elements of combat results and things. And then this is our calendar tracker, and this is our turn phase. And then down here, we have the bombing campaign. So we can see you could be as a bomber group be, you know, in your campaign might be responsible for bombing the sub bases, railroads, river crossings, landings, uh, V1, V2 rocket bombs, breakout. I'm not sure what that is. And then Soviet help kind of thing. So there are a number of campaigns that you're going to be responsible for. And you'll notice over here, if they're going badly, this is one of the lost conditions. You can get sacked. So there are, there's one way you can win the game, and that is by getting your victory point total. So basically, as you run campaigns and accomplish uh, results in the game, you're going to get victory, you're going to accrue victory points. And once it goes to a US positive, you've won the game. You've won the, the air bombing campaign over Germany. Uh, there are a number of ways to lose the game. One is to, is to fail any one of these campaigns, you lose. Uh, the other way, the other way is the victory track goes the other way and reaches the you lose spot. In other words, you've suffered so many losses and not performed well enough that you have failed in the campaign. And then if you don't win by April of 1945, you lose. And then there's also some German automatic victories as you get into these later turns, where it basically it means it's mathematically impossible to win because you've failed so badly. So you could it just saves you from playing out the game when there's no hope for you to win. So basically, you've got to win by April 1945 by doing enough damage and, and restricting your own losses that the bombing campaign is a success while making sure you don't fail at any one of these bombing campaigns as well. All right, let's take a look at our map now. Jump in here. This is a 22 by 28 inch mounted map. And it basically shows, it's kind of a, a little bit of an abstract kind of element here. We've got, uh, it's an area map, so you're moving your groups through these areas and things like that. And then we can see over here, we've got a lot of the berm, uh, uh, German bombing targets and what they represent, like aircraft industries, industry, oil industries, and things like that. And basically, as the game goes on, you're mo as you and, and you get into a month, you know, you're going to be doing some of the the preparation work for that month. But the heart of the month is when you're executing your missions and you're bringing your bombers up into here, trying to bomb these different areas in Germany. And then Germany, of course, is sending up fighters, and your fighters are trying to protect you. And you get these air combat rounds, and then your bombers come back, and then you're trying to regroup. You bring in new bombers. You're 
fit bombers. You know, Germany is building up and repairing their industry and things like that, and then off you go again. So each turn is a month, and the heart of each turn is that one mission that you missions that should be running. You might be running multiple missions in a given month. And if we look over here on the right, we can see the uh, victory point tracks. Here we have the you lose if you go off the other end of it. And then this is the staging area where damaged squadrons and groups can be uh, put and then eventually brought back into action with kind of refitting and elements like that. So there we have it. That is 8th Air Force. Now let's jump over and take a look at 20th Air Force. So let's talk a little bit about the big picture look at 20th Air Force, which is again similar to 8th Air Force, but there's a quite a bit of difference here, kind of, you know, outside of the, the theme that you're looking at. Th this game starts in September of 1944 and it runs until November of 1945. So this game is 15 turns in length, whereas 8th Air Force is 28 turns for that full game. I'm not sure if that means that 20 20th Air Force is longer, uh, uh, sorry, 8th Air Force is longer in that first campaign. I assume it does. However, 20th Air Force has more complexity to the combat, and there's kind of a research element in here as well that makes me think that perhaps each month takes a little bit longer to play in 20th Air Force. Having said that, 15 turns compared to 28 turns for 8th Air Force. I'm going to guess that the time play for this one is maybe two to three hours, maybe a little bit shorter than that of 8th Air Force. But again, I'm speculating. Like 8th Air Force 2, the turn lengths are one month long. And like 8th Air Force, you're working with groups and then attaching squadrons to those groups, both for the Japanese fighters that are trying to shoot you down and then for the U.S. bombers. Now, there aren't fighters in 20th Air Force. So that's a different, you know, this is high altitude bombing. So it's basically for the, the air combat element of 8th Air Force that's in 8th Air Force. It really isn't present, you know, fighter to fighter air combat isn't present in 20th Air Force. But let's open it up now and take a look. So 20th Air Force has a 22 page rule book, so four pages longer than 8th Air Force. Uh, but like the 8th Air Force, this again is the revised version. So I think a lot of the ambiguities that happened in the first edition have been clear, uh, cleared up because I know that uh, Fortress Games is really good at responding to questions and revising things, and I'm sure taking notes. These games, I know, have been a labor of love for Bob Faneuf over multiple, I think I want to say multiple decades, but I'm kind of guessing here. But there is a, you know, a lot of love put into both of these games in terms of making these fun systems and challenging systems to play. And you know, if they are, again, like uh, Save South Vietnam, which I found really challenging and really, really fun, these should be really, really good. So here we have you know, basically the the bombing mission, same kind of thing. You know, you're, you're going to have kind of a refitting and then a preparation phase, and you're going to be executing missions during the course of a month, and then kind of regrouping after those missions. You know, Japan's going to be rebuilding some of the stuff that you just bombed, and then you go through and lather, rinse, repeat for 15 uh, turns there. Now, there are uh, so, some obvious differences with this game, as we've got incendiaries and atom bombs. And I'll talk a little bit when we look at the counter, the map, about some of the, the elements to the kind of complexities playing it, so some of the complexities here. Um, there are, There is no short campaign for this game, although again, this game is 15 turns long compared to the uh, 28 turns, that's the, uh, the, eighth, uh, the eighth Air Force game here. There are a number of optional rules here. You can play without the ad atomic research and atomic bomb, which makes the game harder for the US. Uh, there is a rocket fighter element that can be deployed for Japan, which is an optional rule that's going to make it harder, but it, there really isn't uh, jets to the same degree that they are as the optional rule in 8th Air Force, and that's kind of one of the differences between the games. Then, you, interestingly enough here, the base game as it is uh, doesn't really account for the Soviet invasion of Japanese-occupied Manchuria. If you add that in as an optional rule, it makes the game easier for you. Likewise, if you add in the 20th Air Force Fighter Wing and 8th Air Force Redeployment, it's going to make it much easier. And these were actually some of the somewhat the historical options that actually happened. But to make the game challenging for the U.S. player, they don't happen unless you want to add them in as optional rules. So that makes the game harder for the U.S. player and makes it a little bit more challenging to win. So really, I like the way they've done this. So you can play it fully historically, but it's just saying if you do that, it's going to be considerably easier than if you don't do that. So for the sake of making it a better game, there's a little bit of hypothetical nature here in terms of those things don't happen. So really cool way, to, I think, to kind of balance out the difficulty of the game. If I have to give this one a complexity, uh, the research element, I think, makes it a little bit more complex. Uh, and so I'm going to give this a three and a half out of ten. But by no means is this a complex game. I wouldn't let the complexity scare you off. And then a solitaire rating, of course, ten out of ten. You know, you could play it collaboratively with two people, but really it's, you know, you against the Japanese AI controlling the fighters and defense of Japan there. Okay. 
Let's jump in now and take a look at our counters. Much of what we mentioned about the 8th Air Force counters applies to these counters here. There are two sheets, uh, each with 13 rows, so 260 counters in this game. About 40% of them are counters and about 60% of them are markers here. Now, again, we can see our bomber groups. These are 5 eighths inch and like the 8th Air Force games, they just are so precisely cut. You've got no nibs or anything sticking out. They've got really good heft to them and thickness and things like that. I'm not going to clip these like I'm not going to clip Atheist Ford. These just look really, really cool. I like these counters a lot. Um, here we have basically groups of uh, B-29s. There is one group of P-51s here. I'm not sure. Two groups of P-51s. I'm not sure why they are there. Uh, but these basically, and there's some P-47s here. So it looks like there is a little bit of Oh, this is the 8th Air Force for the variant, for the optional rules. Okay, I get it, yeah. Um, and here we have the Japanese fighters down here, the Japanese fighter groups, and then these are our squadrons that gets added in. Here is our bombing damage factors, and you'll again in the three uh, atomic bomb uh, B-29s fitted are here as well. And then uh, on this second sheet here, and again, these are one-sided, single-sided, much like uh, 8th Air Force. We've got a lot of the markers to kind of track the game. You can see atomic bombs here, incendiary bombs for this type of, for when the cities are on fire. And then these are the major six cities of Japan. And we can talk here as we're looking at this, how you uh, win the game. So in this game, the win in, the victory conditions in the, are, are very kind of straightforward and simple compared to the multiple ways you can lose 8th Air Force. But you have to destroy the 15 minor cities by the end of turn 15. But the minor city bombing campaigns don't trigger until you have destroyed the major cities, Tokyo, Kawasaki, Yokohama, Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe. So once these are knocked out of action, and I think by large you have to do that as incendiary bombs, I might be a little bit off there, then you can start targeting the minor cities and you have to get all 15 of the minor cities either with incendiary bombs or atomic bombs to end the game there. If you don't do that by the end of turn 15, you lose. So it's, a, a, you know, a, I think a certainly a very simple, more direct victory status in this game, although you know, it's not complex by any means in 8th Air Force as well. But yeah, these are all the counters for the game. And now uh, let's take a look at our... Kim uh, playing aids here. There are three of them. Like with 8th Air Force, we get combat results tables here. There is a bombing by Navy uh, segment uh, phase of the turn as well. We've got you know, manufacture, new group placement, destroyed minor city restoration. Combat results are down here. So some of the basic charts to help us through. And now here, this is what is different. One of the elements that's different in 20th Air Force is this research that happens. And so basically you are trying to research training to improve the skill levels of your crews at high altitude bombing. And then reconnaissance represents the fact that at the beginning of the campaign, you really don't know where a lot of the bombing targets are in Japan. And so you've got to kind of identify them and figure out where they are. Then incendiaries is the research for that type of bombing. And then you get down here to atomic bomb research, which is, has to be done. I think this happens after these three, where you can start researching the atomic bomb to develop that and get those into action as well. So there is a, you know, depending upon how you're doing and how you're spending your research points, you're going to be building up these elements, hopefully getting into the atomic bomb research and make that functional. And this type of uh, gameplay isn't present in 8th Air Force. Then we have Japanese industry damage kind of charts that you're going to be tracking the damage on these here, major city repair. So you get an idea for some of the things that are going to be happening in the game. And then like with 8th Air Force, this is our calendar tracker. We can see the turn record track is shorter. These are the bombing campaigns that are in action. So we've got mine laying, kamikaze bases, ports, Olympic prepar the Operation Olympic Preparation. So you've got those elements in there too. And then new groups and how they're coming in here. And then here we see the turn phases. The turn phase in this game is, is a little bit more complex uh, because of that research element than it is in 8th Air Force. Uh, both games, I didn't show the dice, dice in 8th uh, Air Force, but you've got a green and a red die. And oftentimes in these, you're rolling them, I believe, to kind of get uh, two digit numbers, but I might be mistaken on that part there. Now, let's take a look at our map. Uh, like that of 8th Air Force, this is 22 by 28 inches, and it's going to I'll kind of show a zoom out as I pull it out here. So this uh, basically shows the map of Japan, and we've got the same type of action that we have in 8th Air Force, where you're going to be conducting missions, and they're going to be moving up in here, bombing these targets, and then coming back. So you've got kind of mission prep and some of preparatory phases, executing your mission, you're going to get attacked by fighters and that kind of stuff, and then you're coming back out to kind of re regroup back home. The other thing I want to mention here too, that the bombing 
uh, phases here are more complicated because each of these major six Japanese cities uh, has air production, oil output, infrastructure, and housing that are targets here too. And I believe you've got to get them like all to a 75% on the city element itself in order to be able to consider those targets destroyed. So the, the bombing of these targets is more complex and more intricate in, in, in not a bad way, in a good way perhaps, uh, than compared to that of 8th Air Force. But yeah, these are uh, you know really cool looking. I really like these maps. These are updated and new and they're really nice thick cardboard, so uh, uh, your mounted maps here, so that's going to be really nice to play on. So very much looking forward to this. And with that set in mind, let's take a reflective look now back on the differences between 8th Air Force and 20th Air Force. I mean, my, my recommendation, I think both of these games are going to be really fun to play. So you know, if you like these types of games, you, you might want to get both of them. But if you are thinking, well, I'll get one and test the waters first, I thought I would just highlight some differences here first. So the obvious one is the thematic difference. You know, 8th Air Force is over Germany, 20th Air Force is over Japan. So that's probably the biggest element there, too. Now, 8th Air Force has, the U.S. forces have fighters in 20th Air Force, it's very minimal. They don't have fighters engaged. So you get fighter-to-fighter -fighter combat as a phase in the missions with 8th Air Force, whereas that doesn't happen in 20th Air Force. That's different. Now, the bombing system in 8th Air Force is simpler. The bombing system in 20th Air Force is more intricate and more complex. Depending on if you're looking, if you're looking for something a little bit simpler, you might want 8th Air Force to try. If you're new to solitaire gaming or new to war gaming, this might be a better choice. If you're experienced or just like that little extra level of intricacy and complexity, then I think 20th Air Force might be a good choice for you there. The optional rules jets in 8th Air Force. It's a mini kind of mechanic and whole system within the game in 8th Air Force. The optional rule for the, the rocket, the jets for Japan in this game is, is less developed. It's a very minor optional rule. It's a kind of a big kind of variant in this game as well. Another factor here, uh, the research in terms of researching your, your, your basically your incendiaries, your reconnaissance, um, your training, and then atomic bombs as well in 20th Air Force. And of course, a huge factor here is the use of, use of atomic weapons in the 20th Air Force game where you don't have that in 8th Air Force. Lastly, uh, the 8th Air Force is 28 turns in its full campaign with a shorter 16 turn variant. Uh, 20th Air Force is 15 turns. And again, not having played them yet, I'm not sure to what, to what degree 20th Air Force might be shorter in its full campaign game. Uh, but again, you do have a shorter variant here with that 16 turn variant. So I think both could be made the same, made the same length, but I'm gonna guess it's gonna take a little longer to play 8th Air Force. So, uh, you know, with the, this one has its basic 15 turn campaign with a, a greater variety of optional rules in it. Um, whereas the 8th Air Force, again, has that longer campaign and a shorter campaign. So that's difference. But in terms of gameplay length, because this one has a shorter campaign, Campaign, I think really that's probably not a factor in which ones to choose. And there you go, a list of differences between 8th Air Force and 20th Air Force. Both of them again use very similar systems, the gameplay is going to be very similar, but enough subtlety and variety here that I think they're going to feel different and be uh, great as both uh, standalone games in their own right. With that being said, I'd also lastly like to call thanks so much for watching. I'd like to direct you to the community page on the channel uh, to go vote for which one, 8th Air Force or 20th Air Force, you want to see a full playthrough of. Be coming to that in a couple of months from now, so I've got a couple, two, three other games I want to play before that, but it will be coming springish. A couple months or so are going to get to that. And if you haven't seen yet our playthrough of Save South Vietnam, I'm going to put a link to that right here. I encourage you to check that out. That was such a fun campaign and really just a joy to play. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Have a great day.